Uh, namaste and good, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this NLC Talk program. My name is Gyansa Rayangrum. I'm Executive Committee Member of Nepal National Committee on Immigration and Internationalship. Uh, NAMSID is a national committee of ICID, International Commission on Irrigation and Drainage, and Nepal has been a member of ICID since 50 years now. Uh, ICID is a leading scientific, technical, and professional non not for profit international organization with a vision of a water secure world uh, free of poverty and hunger through sustainable rural development. It is a knowledge sharing platform. Uh, so it brings together various stakeholders um, and multidisciplinary professionals to deliberate on technical, agronomic, socioeconomic, uh, manage, uh, environmental and managerial com complexities uh, for the development, management and operation of irrigation, drainage and flood management works. Uh, therefore, in order to share and exchange knowledge and experiences among these multidisciplinary uh, professionals, NANCIT has been organizing this uh, talk program as a part of Irrigation and Drainage Talk Series. Uh, in this series, an event is held every second Tuesday of every month according to Bikram Samad calendar. And uh, today's event is the 20th episode of this series. The announcement for the 21st episode will be shared at the end of this uh, event, so stay with us till the end. Uh, please follow our Facebook page, uh, Nepal National Committee on Irrigation and Drainage, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Nancy Nepal. If you want to check any past episodes of this uh, talk series, they are all available in our channel. Uh, if you have any suggestions, comments, or feedbacks, please write to us at nancy.nepal at gmail.com. Now, uh, let's start with the uh, ground rules. Uh, this session will be an hour long. And uh, the first 25 minutes will be our presentation, which will be followed by a question, answer, and discussion round. During the session, please kindly mute your microphone and to ask questions or to give comments or to express your viewpoints, we encourage you to maximize the use of chat box. In order to share your opinions verbally, please unmute yourself before speaking. Now, with this brief background, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Vishnu Prasad Pandey from Institute of Engineering, Pulcha Campus, who is also uh, the Executive Committee Member of uh, Nepal National Committee on Education and Redundancy to introduce the speaker and moderate the session. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, madam. Uh, good, next slide, please. Today, we'll, we are very much pleased to have with us Dr. Rocky Talsa a good friend, uh, to talk about evaluating the potential of using earth observations and remotely sensed information in agricultural water management. Uh, Dr. Talsa Badel is working as a research scientist uh, with the Texas a &M University in the USA, where he leads hydrology, remote sensing, and water research uh, in the Texas a &M Agri Life Research Center in El Paso. He obtained his undergraduate degree in civil engineering and master's in water resource engineering from the Institute of Engineering at Truman University. In 2017, he was awarded his PhD in civil and earth resources engineering from Kyoto University in Japan. He also worked as a postdoctoral research fellow under the JSPS postdoc fellowship program. He has published extensively more than 70 publications uh, in the area of the in the pressing area of this 21st century. For example, a better understanding of the chance changes in a hydrological system under climate change for sustainable water management uh, and associated fields. His expertise includes hydrology, climate change, hydraulics, sediment transport, and geospatial modeling. Earth observation, machine learning, and big data analytics are a substantial part of his research. With this very, very brief background, I would like to invite Dr. Talsa Badil for uh, his talk. Uh, you have 25 minutes for your talk, and that will be followed by another about half an hour of uh, this question and answer or the discussion. Now the floor is yours. Jigan Saji, could you please stop sharing the slide? <clears throat> thank you, uh, Dr. Vishnu, and thank you, Jigyasa. Uh, Thanks for providing me opportunity to share some of my research findings. And today, I don't have that much uh, local information or local case study result, uh, result based on agriculture or irrigation in Nepal. So 
I am trying to compile most of the information related to auth observation because these days we have uh, essence power of these auth observation that can be used for our water resource modeling. Uh, let me share my screen. <clears throat> Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, let me start my presentation where, uh, in this presentation, I basically compile uh, most of the information related to auth observation, which are again not complete. I just try to put uh, representative uh, auth observation or remotely sensed information that are uh, mostly important in ag water management or total water resource modeling. Basically, when we talk uh, about remote sensing, before digging into remote sensing, what we need to understand is even our eyes, we understand, uh, we look at red, green, blue, which are visible rays, and we our brain understand like uh, based on these information, these are trees, these are water kind of thing. So our brain process something with whatever we see and come up with ideas like these are green uh, vegetation, these are wetlands and based on shape and size are these are circles or these are kind of things. So with just limited information that we see, we recognize lots of things, we recognize water, wetland, everything. But when we talk about remote sensing, remote sensing allows us looking beyond that what we are normally looking. For example, if we talk basically with multispectral remote sensing, we have more than uh, five or 10 or even 30 bands of information. That means we can see beyond our limit, we can look at infrared or thermal information by which we can train some machine to let them know uh, these are more accurate uh, than what we really looking at. And again, uh, under remote sensing, there is a, a big wide uh, range of hyperspectral sensor, which again gives us information for like, let's say uh, more than hundred bands of information. That means with the use of these auth observation, which they are taking continuously, we can, assume our on gauge basin where we are treating, uh, we don't have sufficient data. We can get information from this odd observation and treat on gauge basin also as gauge basin, but there are certain limitations when we link with our remotely sensed data because we need to uh, know the spatial resolution. The slide on the, the figure on the right shows a synopsis of different uh, mission that they are collecting data so some satellites are getting data on high spatial resolution, but they might be commercial and some are uh, taking observation on coarse resolution. So there are again, the, uh, different sort of uh, techniques where we can blend uh, high spatial resolution and uh, low spatial resolution to bring um, blended data uh, for our purpose. So we can take use of different these purpose and if you look at uh, recent uh, innovation and recent mission uh, where they are uh, coming up with different hyperspectral mission, that means we can have data uh, with information more than 100 bands. And for example, let's take a mission Landsat, which is, I understood like we normally know about Landsat mission. So Landsat mission has been taking data all the way from 1970s and it is also evolving and as of now, it has additional data layer than the previous Landsat 1, 2, and 3. So we have information not only from visible band, we have information related to infrared, information related to thermal band. So we can estimate thermal properties or we can indirectly get information related to photosynthesis, indirectly get information related to water bodies across our, our domain. So this is a Landsat eight bands. Uh, as of now, we, Landsat is getting data at 30 meter resolution for uh, more than seven or eight bands. And there is a panchromatic band, which is giving 15 meter resolution. So when we combine 
uh, information from this sensor, what we have is, if we just think as layman, we normally see visible light uh, with uh, a 0.38 micrometer uh, to 0.7, which we can see. And with that visible range also, we can detect many things. So in terms of uh, looking at those wavelengths, some animals, they see beyond our limit, like goldfish see infrared or some bees, uh, they can look at ultraviolet light. So what happened is when we took this auth observation as our complementary thing, then we human can also see beyond our limit and we can process them and get information related to water modeling. I don't want to go in detail to all these missions, but again, I also want to highlight one thing like recently, the International Space Station, it is coming up with a, a new mission for next four or five years. These space stations are uh, located even half of the altitude of typical uh, satellites. That means they are observing us with uh, less altitude mean high spatial resolution. For example, uh, as of now, there are four missions uh, OCO3 is basically taking care of measuring solar induced fluorescence from which we can indirectly compute photosynthesis or diurnal variation of uh, evapotranspiration kind of thing so that water requirement for different varieties of crop can be estimated. Uh, so this is GEDI that, so this is a typo mistake. So JDI mission is taking care of 3D view of the earth uh, so that the height of canopy can indirectly be estimated that will allow us uh, to provide information for our hydrological model related to canopy height, uh, effective rainfall kind of thing. Again, eco stress, if someone is interested, interested in uh, high spatial resolution of temperature related thing like land surface temperature, then eco stress is complementing other thermal bands that are open source available for Landsat and other astro band. And uh, there is again hyperspectral thing which is evolving out, and there are many hyperspectral uh, emission coming out, which will certainly provide us more information than that uh, what we are normally getting. So in a north cell, what we see is we are just looking at RGB with multispectral something like Landsat, Modis, Astro. They are giving a uh, ten to thirty bands of information. With hyperspectral, we are getting even 100, 500 level of bands information. So with this diversity of uh, data, we can look at mineralogy in soil or soil salinity or water quality. So this type of analysis we can look at with those uh, sensors. Uh, in a north cell, when we look at what we have is if with RGB, we are getting information for three bands. Now with uh, hyperspectral, we have information for from 100 band. And if we have some in-situ measurement, if someone requirement is more related to water quality or near your wetland, and we have our in-situ data, we can train model with 500 bands of hyperspectral information. And we can have a early warning of maybe if some crop is getting stress next month, we can have that information with earlier information from hyperspectral band, which normally we cannot have uh, with just a limited number of bands. So there is a whole bunch of new research area where we can in, in this, this sort of data for our analysis. Let's look on very simple example uh, by which we can understand the details of how gonna we use auth observation to bring to our information. For example, if we just take normalized difference vegetation index, which is quite simple. Uh, it is dependent on near infrared and red spectral band. And if we look at just the image on left, the green vegetation normally is has a, a, a near infrared reflectance of 50%. And what happened to dry or brown vegetation is it has high reflectance in visible range. So with this distinct signature, we can detect brown versus green plants, or uh, there are different sort of those indices. For example, I am just showing one link. Um, perhaps I can share this slide. 
to you all guys so that all links you can go through it so this particular uh, spectral indices uh, python library compute us more than 200 indices which are related to vegetation, water, soil, salinity, water quality, using earth observation. As of now, I just showed one example for NDVI. So we can use, uh, based on our requirement, different level of indices and different level of earth observation to look at what we want to look at. Let's again uh, come to NDVI. So I just did a quick analysis for Nepal. I just did uh, this one a couple of days back. So uh, I am not going to present intensive analysis, but I just wanted to show uh, anomaly based on uh, NDVI. Right now, I am showing a median NDVI. That means it is representing a median value of vegetation for one year. And the green uh, image at left bottom shows the mean value for 20 years. That means it's a, a long-term average vegetation uh, for NDVI and the anomaly here I compute is basically uh, this year uh, vegetation index minus long-term average divided by standard deviation. So if it is zero mean, it is normally near to normal. If it is plus one mean, that is one time standard deviation or plus two mean is uh, two times standard deviation. It's minus one mean it is uh, in negative anomaly, but uh, linking to one times of standard deviation. So we can look at how vegetation are evolving kind of things. So I just give, gave an example of vegetation. So if someone is interested to look at vegetation during dry period. So for now, I just computed a five percentile. That means you can assume it as a driest vegetation time of the year. Uh, I can come up with minimum. Uh, sometime minimum can be a, noisy because of different um, biases uh, contaminated on earth observation. So five percentile is giving the lowest uh, vegetation for a particular year. And if you look at uh, left bottom, it is the long-term average of uh, low vegetation time. And you can look at uh, different year where it's showing green mean they are above uh, normal. Like 2017, 2018 seem to be above normal in terms of vegetation. So you can do, those sort of analysis for your command area for irrigation or water set for your location. As of now, I just did a quick analysis for whole Nepal. Uh, I am showing this for 95 percentile. That means it is for, uh, you can say greenest pixel of the year. And it is a, a, a long, uh, it's an interannual variation of 95 percentile of vegetation. So for different uh, median percentile, the variations are not always same. So it depends on different uh, natural systems. So natural systems are always complex. So we can do those assessment using different sort of art observation. As of now, as I'm again saying, we can do for different indices, look at soil salinity, look at other water bodies, maybe use different index. And again, what we can do with earth observation is like I showed, we have different mission coming up with different data. Some data are coming for thermal information like temperature, land surface temperature. Some are coming with uh, soil moisture kind of thing. We can coordinate these direct results with those satellite based data. As of now, I, I'm showing precipitation information like what I did for NDBI, but I, I am using a reanalysis data. We have a whole a uh, bunch of data for some sort of reanalysis data or already uh, some hydrological model are run on a regional or global model. We have that data for everywhere. So this Terra climate is one hydrological model based reanalysis data. We stores all water, uh, water uh, balance data, even soil moisture, actual evapotranspiration, potential evapotranspiration, all those data are available. As of now, I am showing precipitation anomaly. So we can link precipitation anomaly with uh, vegetation anomaly and see connection between our precipitation, the uh, driving factor for vegetation. So we can look in that way. Or uh, uh, here I am uh, again looking at Terra climate data. We can also do for land surface temperature based on MODIS or Aster or uh, other Landsat data. Uh, with Earth observation, you have power to look at uh, maybe 50 years back, 30 years back, or 10 years back. So I am doing same thing for temperature anomaly. We can see 2009 and 10 stand to be uh, even warmer than other uh, 
uh, beyond uh, time like 2019 and 2020, but it's based on uh, Terra climate reanalysis data. We can again check these data with our in situ ground based data. For that, uh, we need to focus on one command area or one catchment area, what I said, and look at in situ data, compare with what gauge data are showing and what other sort of these auth observation data are showing. And if, so this is not a direct one, uh, I think, uh, sorry, uh, this is not. I think, okay, okay, right now you can see. It's for our 24 max, there is a direct relation between uh, 24 hour uh, maximum rainfall versus vegetation index. I just uh, wanted to uh, see how those anomaly behave. So you can play with different other indices, maybe uh, growing days, you can compute on your own and compare with growing degree days and vegetation index or vegetation index with other index which you are more expert on. I am neither uh, a remote sensing expert or machine learning expert. So I don't have that much expertise on what indices we should play, but based on what we need, we can uh, complement our water resource model with our observation. And another beauty of this auth observation is like, for example, this one I just did before this uh, meeting, uh, it was maybe half an hour beforehand I was doing quick math and look at the anomaly of temperature from 1961 to right of now. I use again Terra climate data. So with auth observation, you can look at how things are evolving, how land use, land cover are evolving, how crop classes are being changed, how water use are being evolving. So those kind of things you can do, and uh, you can analyze on your own. Now, when we talk about uh, Nepal has different climate class again. So when we deal with highly spatially coarse resolution of satellite data, they cannot directly replicable to all, clim uh, all the climate classes of Nepal because in a short latitudinal distance, we have different climate classes varying and there are microclimates also across the country. So we need to be very much careful when we are using different satellite based data we need to compare them with gauge data or we need to have scoring based on available satellite based data. So this is one of the uh, ongoing paper which is currently under review where I try to look at the all water balance parameter that are mostly related to ag water. Uh, this AET is actual evapotranspiration, potential evapotranspiration, precipitation. This is DEF is the climate deficiency that means water needed for plant and water we are providing with precipitation, what is the deficiency? Then runoff is uh, a, a surface runoff across the thing and soil is the water moisture uh, retained in the soil and this T temperature maximum and T minimum are uh, we can understand. So these are uh, some parameters that are available on Terra climate. Terra climate is not only data that uh, we need to rely, I am just giving example, there are lots of other data source where we have access to that one. Terra Climate offers data from 1958 to as of now uh, at four kilometer resolution for all these parameters. So I try to do some regional analysis and look at how uh, things have changed uh, based on last 30 years and these 30 years, so I assume T1 as last 30 years and T2 as recent 30 years and look at this uh, water balance parameter across the uh, country. So, and look at how those trends are varying. This is still under review. I am not gonna go in detail for that one, but uh, the potential of using that data are quite enormous because what we can do with this sort of data is even they are not absolutely, maybe they are not uh, representing absolute value for our local climate or local water set or local command area. But what we can do is we can make a correlation based on upstream downstream correlation. We have runoff at each grid. So we can have a correlation between uh, ungauge basin and gauge basin, or we can compare with what we have uh, based on our in situ observation and make a use of proportional value from these reanalysis or auth observation so that 
we can convert our on girls basin into some sort of we can say uh, semi girls basin because we have some information for auth observation but they are not really observed in ground but we can get data in that way as of now for irrigation and different purpose we are still relying on empirical relation which were derived based on limited data or we are using maybe medium irrigation project method where we are dividing whole country into only six or seven types of homogeneous region or we are using wet method where those data were based on limited data so we have now lots of art observation lots of uh, reanalysis data which we can take care and update those empirical relation update those model for designing irrigation or agriculture or water kind of thing and when we again deal with those satellite based data uh, for example uh, here i am showing uh, the top one is the long term average like 30 years average precipitation that is giving us a climatological average we can compare with our uh, gauge based data and look at are they usable and on year by year basis you can look at how extreme are varying or how precipitation are varying so those we can do for all kind of soil moisture and any sort of data and if we have some gauge data for example uh, if you look at this uh, Eight pixel, and we have two data. We can compare with point to pixel wherever we have data. So this oh, we normally do. As of now, I am showing uh, comparison of satellite based rainfall with gauge data rainfall. Uh, we can compare for different product. Like I showed here, I am showing for different precipitation product. That means you are looking at different mission. And for same uh, IMOS product, uh, this is published in one another paper where i look at different versions so for one product also you can look at different version how early product late product or final product are behaving and for example for any one product also let me go to there for any one product which are promising in nepal uh, as of now this is published in remote sensing journal where i look at different data source for imers final so imers final imers stands to be one of the promising data for based on different uh, compared satellite and based on early, late, and final, I found final version to be best. And among final also, what we can do is we can look at other data source like based on microwave-based precipitation, infrared-based precipitation, or a different version. So we can look at data based on different mission. Inside one mission, we can look at different RON. And inside RON also, we can look at different data source. There are different way where we can look at deep observation and sources what we can do and in a long sum i just want to uh, conclude my presentation uh, here after that i have just used those satellite observation for different model what i normally do is i sometimes force hydrological model with gauge data and if sometimes gauge data are missing we use satellite data to force that hydrological model or Go in detail to this one you can look at by paper uh, if someone is interested for example uh, one paper was spotlighted in azu eos where i try to highlight there are pros and cons of satellite based estimate because satellite estimates also have biases so in this paper what i did was i used available gauge data to correct poor performing satellite data and also use satellite data to fill data gap because what happened is sometimes the gauging station can also be washed away during your time of analysis or sometimes there might be gap so what you can do with our observation is sometimes they can complement gauge data or sometimes they can directly be used for our uh, final analysis and Apart from that, I have just put different case studies using different auth observation in my different research. And currently what I am doing uh, as my ongoing effort is I'm trying to use a parameter transfer based on two gauge basin, but assuming another gauge basin as an on gauge basin. So we call it pseudo on gauge basin. And if parameter can be transferred, and we can just force using auth observation so what we are trying to do is we even we have gauge data we are trying to force only with our observation and we are comparing with gauge data and we are trying to uh, transfer that parameter to another basin uh, to compare the validity we need some gauge data 
uh, based on stream flow kind of thing. So I am assuming pseudo unguessed concept. And when we just try to uh, simulate for different other area where we don't have JS information. So this is one of the ongoing effort where we are trying to transfer for Himalayan basin like of now the blue is transferring to another blue and the uh, brown is transferring to another brown. And I am also doing some sort of machine learning to blend data or sometimes downscale data because, as I said, uh, some of our observations are highly core, but we have other predictors which are available on uh, high resolution. So what we can do is we can blend different resolution data and come up with blended, especially downscale data. So this is what I want to share with you. I just you know, want to uh, give a final conclusion like, we can use our observation to complement data and data gap problem and simulate in on gauge area. And at last, I would like to thank Nancy for providing me opportunity to share some of my results, result and share my ideas and compiled information. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Talsa Vadil, for sharing very, very interesting insights about the application of remote sensing and earth observation for agriculture water management. We highly appreciate it. Now the floor is open for questions and answers. Uh, if you have any questions, you can write down directly in the chat box or raise your hand and, and speak out directly. Uh, I haven't seen any questions so far in the chat box. Please feel free to share either questions or query or any viewpoints or comments or in whatever form it is. In the meantime, what I can do is I can copy this presentation so if anyone is interested to look at sure, later and that's if fine. they have some Thank questions you. they can email me as well okay, while others are still thinking i have one question for you you know mm -hmm. remote, remote sensing product like we all know has uh, some limitation in terms of spatial uh, resolution right so if we talk about agricultural water management we talk about a farm scale so what about the accuracy concern about application of those products? And do we have some experience from elsewhere uh, of application of such products for farm, farm level or agriculture water management? Do we have some insights on that? Yeah, true, true. A very much true thing. And the real thing is I have some results based on those farm level data, but they are focused on US, so I didn't share. What happened is there is a precision agriculture, we call it. When, what we really do with auto observation, we do similar technique, but we fly drones. We put similar sort of sensor and measure them so that we can get data on centimeter scale. But again, uh, auto observation are also powerful. For example, if your resolution, you are thinking with three meter kind of thing, you want to get some information, then you can rely on some sort of planet data for, as of now for Nepal, planet data are also available for us. We don't need to buy that data. And it is giving us uh, daily observation, but for us, the free data is on a monthly scale. But on a monthly scale, we get data for RGB, which are visible, and one band for infrared. So with infrared, we can get some sort of water, dry forces, or vegetation kind of thing at three meter resolution with free one. But again, there is some commercial data if you want to have some, some local problem you want to solve and you want to look at auth observation there are something like maxar data available at 10 centimeter there is a way and if you just want to solve problem related to your small command area then the better solution is to fly your own drone with the small sensor make your own measurement compare them for example uh, with drone, you have lots of uh, centimeter scale observation and observation is giving us in the 10 by 10 meter resolution. Then we can compare that result with that one. And if there is some good logistic regression or linear regression, we can upscale them. So that is one way we do here in US. We fly drone on a monthly scale uh, using multispectral and hyperspectral imaging and look at all one tree by another tree. And we look at how one tree is behaving with, uh, and if there are some or uh, behaving differently and what is water use, irrigation use. So we can do it in that way, but that is a different remote sensing. We call it yeah. precision agriculture. What, what and, we normally try to see is if the data are available, how to harvest that for our application. We normally see for that one. Uh, flying drone is of course uh, one of the application, but uh, what we are trying to see at the moment is what are the readily available data set 
which can mm -hmm. be applied for intended use. Anyway, that's fine. Thank you. So the conclusion is yes, that those data are available, but we may need to pay if we want a higher resolution and higher temporal resolution also, right? That's the message. Uh, any other questions or query or any maybe sharing of your experience from anyone in the uh, who are participating here? I see a question from Raj Silpakar. Very nice presentation. I have one question regarding the IMERS data. I'm using IMERS data of early run for forecasting precipitation rather than IMERS final run. Final run mm -hmm. has 3.5 months latency and early run has four hours latency. It's uh, uh, some sharing of information. So anything to add here, Rakhi ji? Yeah, I, I got his point. I think like uh, he wanted to say maybe I'm more final if we want to look at today or tomorrow, we cannot use because this latency is four months. We need to wait for four months to get that calibrated version. So basically, IMOS data are giving us near real time. We call this early version and late version as a near real time. That means you are getting some information. So if you want to look at some disaster event, look at flood inundation, then IMOS early version, even they are not that much correct, maybe the one option you need to look at and what is the scenario of precipitation on your region? That is one way. But if your interest is to look at evolution for next 10 years and look at water availability, then I suggest to look at IMERS final run. You are using some sort of water availability modeling or maybe HEC SMS or hydrological model or look at something. Then IMERS final may be one option to look at. But if your interest is you want to do something in two months of time and look at inundation or landslide kind of thing, then you need to look at IMERS late or IMERS early version. All right, thank you. There's one more question from Kimra, sir. Uh, in case the gauge data are not reliable or not available at all or missing, how can we compare satellite data on such, such a situation or how can we apply the best the satellite product in those, in those cases? Any insights on that? Yeah, thank you for this one. Uh, very much pertinent question like what when we try to deal with what we have is sometimes gauge data have missing data and again satellite data are having some biases so, so there isn't the direct way compare one to one so what we suggest to do is whenever there are homogeneously available time we make a best comparison between them and based on that particular time if you come up with some ideas like this is superior or this one is good, then you have some correction factor. Maybe this this can be local correction factor or it can uh, go for monthly correction factor. Then use that correction factor regionally for uh, gauge data to fill get uh, data gap. And there is another way if you are okay to use some machine learning model, then there are ways to fill data gap on yourself to blame those things. We are also using some sort of machine learning to blame gaze data and earth observation or field uh, gaze data uh, using data available from satellite data. I have uh, discussed a bit on that paper with, I had similar issue, like some station were recording some data and there were gaps and some satellites are showing different things. So you, you need to compare different satellite mission. You need to do one by one, what is your requirement? If you are looking at, again, temporarily, hourly scale or daily scale, there are data limitation, maybe in Nepal, like if you want to look at hourly scale, you don't have gauge data looking at soft daily scale. So there are different limitations. So you need to adapt with that scenario. And yes, our observation are observing us, for example, IMERS is observing at half hour resolution. So you know something in half hour resolution. What I do normally is we have 24 hour rainfall, for example, at one location, and we have half hour resolution data of IMERS. So we can compare 24 hour aggregated IMER versus 24 hour rainfall and make that uh, bias corrected use for making a soft daily rainfall at your location based on bias corrected based on 24 hours. So we need to deal with what we have, but if we have automatic weather station at any location, we can make a dynamic bias correction on the soft daily. Rain. So it depends on what we have and how we approach. Thank you. And there's one more comment uh, related to your MIT classes, uh, old the seven uh, regions oh. in the old information. Now already our 22 regions are updated there. That's for your information. Any other yeah. queries, questions, or sharing uh, from anyone? 
or maybe maybe can i maybe request someone from department of water resource and irrigation to highlight and what could be the i mean things that we are looking as a department for uh, i mean that potentially the satellite based products can be useful for us if someone working on agriculture and water management maybe maybe tika sir if you have any insights a couple of maybe things that these are the things we are uh, facing the problem if you can have that maybe then dr rocky may, may provide some suggestion on that if any there is someone from department any feedback or, or any insights on the issues that we are facing yes hello yes tigram sir please well, thank you, Rocky, for the presentation. It was quite interesting. But we're still looking forward to uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Pandey has raised that maybe the use of remote sensing to the level of farm is more important mm -hmm. for us because especially when you talk about the irrigation systems, we need uh, to work with the high resolution data and, and the data which might be needed very frequently. So, I think the, the course is resolution data we we have been using for modeling or some other purpose uh, might not be so uh, useful when we talk about agricultural water management. So I think we need to find out some uh, way out to frequently re receive the high resolution uh, data, which is more important in fact, uh, when you talk about uh, agricultural water management. Uh, recently we are working with uh, the, the MI system of uh, irrigated agriculture, especially through the EDMS system that we recently developed, where we are trying to uh, try trying to delineate the actual um, irrigated area um, in the entire country. But at the same time, these data are uh, need to be updated very frequently based on the the irrigation facility that will be provided through the existing irrigation system. So I think validating those information with the remote sensing techniques will be the one of the methods that can be that we could use in futures. So mm -hmm. in future, we will be uh, talking with you or maybe in, uh, in contact with you to collaborate mm -hmm. if possible to validate such information. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Very uh... Uh, sharing very useful information that what department needs uh, and what could be the potential application of the remote sensing in that one. Of course, I mean, very uh, pertinent expert like Rocky could be really useful for us to solve our problems. Uh, any quick addition, Rocky, if you'd like yeah. to add on? I just want to add a small thing like uh, what we can do from what we have is like, for example, Landsat is observing at 30 meter resolution, Sentinel is observing at 10 meter resolution. So there is a way where we blend Landsat and Sentinel that gives us space with, uh, we can play, uh, get information at 10 meter resolution. So Landsat is observing at 16 days. There are two Sentinel waves are observing on seven or eight days. So when we merge these three, it comes up like our frequency becomes three days and 10 meter resolution. This is one way. And another thing is like uh, MODIS is there, which is observing on a daily scale. Uh, for example, uh, MODIS has two sensors, Aqua and Terra at day and night and it's observing on a daily scale, but it's course one kilometer resolution. So there is a way we blend MODIS one kilometer resolution to Landsat 30 meter resolution and make a blended, it's a synthetic data, but what we have is a one kilometer uh, MODIS daily and 30 meter 16 days Landsat, we blend and make the blended resolution daily data. So we get a land surface temperature and we can indirectly uh, come up with evapotranspiration. Here in US, there is an open ET recently been launched for Southwest US. They come up with a, a evapotranspiration at all grids. So as of now, it's 70 by 70 meter resolution because they are mostly relying on eco stress, which is, I just talked like, this is a new mission where they are really measuring thermal bands. So temperature with five bands. So you have accurate temperature at each grid, it's 70 meter resolution, but the accuracy is as pinpoint and you estimate with that temperature evapotranspiration. That means how much water is required by crop, different crops. And that has been used for uh, 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 water availability model here, at least rise as of now in Southwestern US. So those kind of approach we can use, we can downscale, uh, we can say, uh, make a best use of different thing. And if 
I am allowed, like maybe if uh, we blend planet data, which are at least for Nepal becoming a developing country, we have three meter resolution and blend planet with Sentinel and Landsat, we can bring down that 30 meter information to three meter information. There are uncertainty always, but there are ways where we can at least come up with some sort of a blended information which we call Earth observation data fusion. Uh, there is a whole uh, method uh, we can explore and at least try in Nepal, uh, can we get information on common area basis, water availability, so we can explore that thing. Uh, that is just my addition. To Thank you. Take us Thank on. you. And there's one more interesting uh, comment and, and also a question attached to that from Bisal Dahl, I think who is doing PhD in Finland, if I, I recall properly. He's asking about the term precision irrigation system that you mentioned about. Uh, mm -hmm. He's also doing, uh, trying to see currently about the sustainability of those innovation in the long run. The question here is, those kind of technology may have limited access uh, to, or they have the access to limited farms. And also that they may not be able to account for the stakeholder, like silent stakeholder, like ecosystem. Um, so how we can capture those things or maybe uh, make enhanced access for all set of stakeholders in a precision irrigation system. Any thoughts on that? It may not be directly related to your the particular presentation, but you might have mm -hmm. experience and you may share something, please. Uh, yeah, true. This is... Yeah, 100% true. Like precision agriculture is kind of costly. You can just look at the small scale thing. But recently there are innovative ideas popping out. There are uh, drones which can fly at some height uh, and there are also cheaply available sensors. And we are also trying one uh, low tech technology where we are trying to uh, put a rope kind of thing uh, and tie maybe at two, trees and make a rover so that a small sensor just go like our jeep line kind of thing and during its rowing it measures so this is a low tech technology where you don't need to buy that much thing even a small scale uh, budget can buy small scale of thing which can just row across the rope but it is again giving a linear data so you need to measure at different point but drone is quite easy you can fly uh, in a spatial way so there are yeah, I could not give a direct answer or correct answer for that one, but there are always limitations. But I assume lots of innovation, low tech technology are also coming. And there are some sensors which are measuring seven or eight bands and which are not that much expensive. So uh, that are not that much expensive at all. We can afford them and buy and try. And as of now, we need to do some research because we need to measure in situ measurement also because optical sensor or thermal information are always measuring without any contact. So we need to put some lysimeter or soil moisture sensor at ground and make a comparison. And if that low tech sensor are okay or not, then it can be scalable to bigger area. But there are ways we need to bring undergrad and grad students doing such sort of research also in our course material, then, then we can have, I think, a sustainable solution in coming there slowly. Oh, thank you. And one more question from Bish uh, Pankaj Adhikari is the access to the satellite data for third world country like uh, Nepal. You mentioned a little bit about that, but he's particularly interested being a person working in right. disaster is on what the flood extent satellite data, what kind of access do we have, especially high resolution data, both temporal and spatial? Do we have any insights? Yeah, for a local scale thing, again, we need to rely on commercial one. For example, Sentinel, with Sentinel active sensor, we can get information for inundation even during cloudy days, but they are limited to 10 meter resolution. But if your river or your interest is beyond, uh, you cannot capture on 10 meter resolution, then it's hard as of, as of now to get data from auth observation focusing on, on inundation kind of thing. But if there is some disaster, big disaster kind of thing, there are ways where we can uh, request some data to those commercial thing and they provide uh, on free basis, but it should be national interest. It should come from national interest kind of thing. For example, for this earthquake, which happened in Turkey, which is a big one. So Maxa released their data. So it's open for research. Now Maxa that centimeter scale resolution data are freely open they gave is for research purpose for understanding disaster so it can happen for those disaster thing and if 
we just link with small river scale again yeah we need to either buy or we need to rely with 10 meter and what we can do is like i said we have some panchromatic data for example uh being india near to us we can ask maybe request they have their own uh, mission where cartosat data uh, they are getting information at 2.5 meter resolution so if there is some mou where we can get that panchromatic data at 2.5 meter resolution then we can at least uh, bring information of sentinel and link with cartosat data and come up at a resolution of 2.5 meter which we can do because um, they are making uh, high resolution digital elevation model for nepal using cartosat mission so there are some ways where we can look at uh, using some missions uh, which are mostly focused on south asia all right thank you uh, there is one question from Krishna Singh, sir, but I am not sure either I can capture the question uh, clearly. Would you please explain yourself about the question, Krishna Singh, sir? It's related to the uh, some correction, location specific correction, but I am not sure I can capture it properly. Krishna Singh, sir, if, would you please mind elaborating it, the question? Krishna Singh, sir. Uh, uh, this is some location specific correction. The question is related to that, but I'm not sure what exactly he means here. I think he is trying to say like uh, MIP has been updated, uh, taking care of instead of just seven homogeneous regions, it's updated to 22 based on uh, updated data. So we need to continue these things and look at again. Uh, what our observation are providing us data and what we have in in terms of gauge data and maybe uh, my understanding is I am also trying to do one research which is some sort of aligning with this thing like I'm trying to assume on gauge basin as a gauge basin using the downstream gauge information for example we have a, a basin A which is on gauge but it is uh, flowing down to uh, downstream session where we has gauge data. So make a use of different reanalysis data, make a use of different auth observation and take ratio of runoff based on that basin to the gauge basin and that use the proportion to uh, evaluate with gauge data. So, so some sort of approach we can use and modify to bring information for on gauge basin is something that I want to look at and I'm trying to look. Uh, in doing so, MIP and WEX method, they are also something, they are based on gauge data with limited or whatever data. We make an equation that is fitted and we try to say for this reason, this equation holds true and we can estimate uh, hydrological parameters like maybe January flow, month, March flow. All right. Uh, here I would like to recall the uh, one comment from the camera. So the key thing that we are discussing mostly is how to make our products or the findings make them user friendly easily to the farms and communities in the third world country like well, this is I think key. My opinion here, maybe Dr. Z made is uh, aligning uh, these the research initiatives remaining agencies like Department of Water Resource and Irrigation trying to understand what kind of issues are they facing and maybe utilizing this kind of products um, in a way that that really meets the needs of the implementing agency and demonstrating it uh, in a couple of locations but as mm -hmm. many locations or as many instances as possible would help us to understand that there is really works with the reason of like accuracy. I think that could be the way forward, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's one question from Anup Khanal. You may analyze the different parameters from year 2005 to 2020. Did you find any systematic trend of changes towards recent year against past year? Uh -oh. I haven't done intensive analysis. As I said, for this presentation, I was just doing two or three days back, just look at, this. I was doing this observation and make a code, like make a map so that look at animal. And I try to look at, uh, is temperature warming is only the cause. And I could see there are anomalous here, like 2011, 12 showed by at least that data were even warmer than 2020. So it's not like a continuous uh, constant warming trend for temperature. So, and there is a direct relation between precipitation and vegetation only. Precipitation is a guiding factor, but there are other different 
factors that are affecting the vegetation of that particular land. So we need to make a comprehensive analysis of what are the probable factors and what observation can bring information for that particular factor. So I was trying to say we have different data source and we can use for our purpose as I am a, mostly a hydrological or water resource modeler, I use these technology to, to complement or force model. But as, as of now, if someone is expert in AI domain or someone does know more on uh, maybe soil salinity or even maybe groundwater uh, fluctuation process or photosynthetic thing. So th there are ways you can look at that data and earth observation are one of the uh, tools where we can heavily rely on. And I also wanted to highlight there are challenges when we are dealing with all of this. So these were my key messages. I did not do any intensive analysis on year by year buses. So I cannot give exact answer what train I detected or what pinpoint location I have uh, detected during at least for this presentation. Maybe right. I Thank can you. do and come to you again. Anu. Thank you so much. We have four minutes left. Maybe uh, I've seen the uh, Director General of the Department of Water Resources and Irrigation, also the President of NCD here. So may Susil sir for a short remark. Thank you, Professor Vishnu, sir. And thank you, uh, Dr. Rati Pal Sagarel, for your wonderful presentations, which give us very good insights about the utilizations of um, uh, uh, um, um, earth observation in the field of agriculture and water management. And this um, of the technology had a very good potential use for our hydrologic analysis, catchment analysis, and go to know that irrigation water management and potential fields. But most the utilization of such technology is the access to the data and access to the satellite image. As, in, as per our experience, such images are experienced in our context and for the widespread utilizations, we need to explore user-friendly technology and cheap, cheap data access. I know um, I come to know that um, our uh, development irrigation um, uh, common area, land utilization so far, the um, common area under our building infrastructure developed land have been using, uh, have been changing land utilization patterns to analyze the, um, the trend of the changes and uh, I could bring to manage our irrigation water management. Uh, our irrigation water returns, uh, we do this uh, immediate use. As the immediate use, we can choose these fields. And as, um, uh, and um, uh, predictions of the hydrology, you know, on most of the uh, many rivers are still on those conditions and predictions of the uh, um, correct hydrologic parameters at the in recent years. Uh, extreme events. Uh, um, um, compared to our, uh, um, if we compare our co conventional techniques uh, like MIP, EMIP, OX, in recent years, such methodology is also not very accurate compared to the plots we face in the uh, in some basins. So the extreme events have been increasing to predict such events correctly predict the hydrologic parameters. I think this has good potential use. And very thanks. I would like to thank Dr. Tal Savadeh for wonderful and useful presentations. Also, I see that Dr. Haifet Gani from Indonesia. Many times I met during ICIT conference, 
So I'd like to welcome Dr. Alfred Manu in, in our subsequent episodes as well. And uh, thanks all for participation and interactions. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the remarks. And uh, the key here is that those kind of things are useful to us, but the limitation or the bottleneck is the access to the high resolution, both temporal and spatial resolution data. Unless that is made more accessible to us, our missing is potential is a little bit far away, or we need to wait for many more years for that. That's the key message here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rocky, for your presentation. And thank you, uh, all the participants, for your active participation in the discussion. And also thank you to our Director General for your remarks. Uh, like always, now we'll announce for the next episode. Let me share my slide just a minute here. Uh, the next episode is about uh, the, no, I can't see it, sorry, sorry what happened here, I cannot, just, okay, you can see, is it visible now, hopefully yes. The next one would be, you know, we are having the uh, yeah, UN 2023 20, Water uh, Conference in uh, New York, starting from 20, I think 22 to 23 March, 20, uh, uh, in this sir? year. We yes. cannot see the, um, the episode oh, really? presentation, yes. Maybe I can yes, share it maybe. if if you have a problem. Okay. No, I think I can. Is it okay now? Uh, it's coming up. Yes, it, it's okay. All right. You know, this year we are having UN 2023 World okay. Water Conference. This is having uh, after the first conference held in 1977. I think it's after 46 years already. Uh, so this is a historic year for those who are working in the water sector oh, because geez. this water is getting a high political agenda in the UN conference. So in this one, I heard that Nepal government is also participating and they have the side events uh, approved for that one. So in this context, what we are thinking is uh, having a panel discussion on what does UN 2023 Water Conference means to Nepal. So for um, to make sure that the input from this one is useful to our delegates who are participating there, we are preponing the date a little bit earlier to 14th March 2023. It may not be the second week, uh, second Tuesday of the uh, Nepali month, but we are preponing a little bit so that we can have some insights uh, for that. So this panel discussion. Uh, uh, the panelists for this one is we are still talking with them. Uh, the names are not yet confirmed, so we are not disclosing now. But we'll get back shortly about the names and confirmed program in due course. With this, I would like to conclude today's uh, session. Thank you so much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you very much, indeed. Looking forward.